Hi everybody, this is Casey Dillon at Mental Health America. Um, welcome to the webinar, um, a peer-driven peer solution to um, isolation and social exclusion. Um, so a couple of things about today's webinar. We had so many people sign up that we had to change at the last minute the registration link. So thank you all for bearing with us. We really appreciate that. Um, to listen to the audio portion, um, I mean if you're not listening already you probably can't hear me, um, but you can turn up your computer speakers or you can dial in. Um, and our number is 800-680-6953. So you can share that with anybody you know. We've also typed that in the chat box. So a couple of ways um, that today's webinar is going to work. Um, we're going to be taking questions through the chat box only. Um, so you can just type your question, we'll see it, we'll flag them, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, and those that we can't, we have, we'll leave our emails at the end and you can feel free to contact us after the fact. This webinar is being re recorded and it will be posted on Mental Health America's website um, within two weeks after the event. Um, yeah, so I believe we can just get started. Um, so today we have three awesome speakers. Um, we have Patrick Hendry. Patrick Hendry is the Vice President of Consumer Advocacy, um, not, I didn't print out the updated one, I'm sorry, Peer Advocacy Supports and Services for Mental Health America. Um, he has worked at, uh, as a mental health advocate for the past 24 years. And his areas of expertise include care-provided services, self-directed care, recovery-based trainings, and social inclusion. Um, our next speaker is going to be Kirsten Kaiser. Kirsten um, is one of our head life coach with our social self-directed care program, um, and she's going to be sharing her expertise with us today. And Siobhan Carpenter is a life coach also with our social self-directed care program. Um, so yeah, and a little bit about Mental Health America. Um, we are a national organization. We are currently based out of Virginia. Um, and we have more than 200 affiliates around the country, some of whom are peer run, some of whom aren't, um, some of whom do direct services, community outreach, um, advocacy, the whole gamut. Um, we were founded in 1909 by Clifford Beers. Um, Clifford Beers himself was a peer, um, and he wanted to make a change, and he wanted to make sure that we were all treating people that live, lived with mental health conditions humanely and like people. Um, so that's the mission that Mental Health America carries forward with us today. So without further ado, I would like to kick off our webinar with Patrick. Hi everyone, I'm Patrick Hendry. Um, and I have to excuse my voice today. My allergies are very bad, so I hope you can understand me. Um, I've been working in peer support and advocacy for about 25 years. And for many of those years, I've realized that one of the greatest and impediments to recovery is the social isolation and exclusion that we often face. In surveys all over the country, one of the top things that people cite over and over again is having at least one person who believes in them, having at least one friend. Um, I also understand that peer support relationship is probably the strongest tool we have available to solve this problem. And so that's why I've dedicated several years in developing this program along with Siobhan and Kirsten. Uh, the, yes. the purpose of this program is to advance recovery for the lives of people with serious mental illness. And when we did the pilot for the program, we piloted this program in Northern Virginia for uh, about two years. We work strictly with people with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder because we realized very early on that they were the folks who were having the most difficult time making connections in the community. It's a very innovative program. It uses three primary, actually four, we're not listing one of them, but four primary methods. One is evidence-based practice of psychiatric rehabilitation and then also peer support the emerging best practice of self-directed care, and the individualized uh, person-centered strength-based principles. The results of the program were pretty amazing. People felt less isolated, which helped to increase their self-esteem um, and feelings of self-worth and overall functioning in their lives. And so we'll talk about some of the outcomes of the program a little bit later. Traditional approaches such as medication, hospitalization, uh, psychotherapy, all have limited effectiveness when applied to socialization and 
work aspects of individuals with psychiatric disorders. So although we focus on schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, this, this program would work with anyone who's living with a mental health diagnosis. The impairments in social functioning that influence the lives of people with schizophrenia are really very apparent when you realize that people with schizophrenia are more than six times less likely to remain unmarried. That's an astonishing figure. That's six times more likely than any other disability group. So the way we began the program was the coaches, we hired certified peer specialists to be the coaches. And the first thing we had them do was go through a 60-hour class in psychiatric rehabilitation to Boston University. Now, we've created a manual and trainings for this program so that people who are going to replicate the program won't have to go through the full trainings that, that our initial coaches did. They also went to professional life coach training which help people to discover their own answers for problems and identify challenges and to challenge your thoughts and behavior patterns. Then we also uh, you know, use the principles of peer support and with the ethics and boundaries that are unique to peer support, the idea of mutuality in the relationship between the individual receiving the service and the person providing the service. We use the principles of shared decision making and effective listening. We also use uh, motivational interviewing, social inclusion training, and a number of other specialized skill sets that uh, we'll talk about later in the training. Kirsten? Kirsten, would you like to take the next slide? Well, I'll pick it up then. Um, the It's My Life program is based on the belief that individuals are capable of choosing their own services and making purchases that will help them regain or remain on the road to recovery and to develop or regain a social life with meaningful, productive activity. Self-directed care is a unique model. Um, it's where the individual chooses their own goals, decides on their own action plan or their path to recovery, um, receives a budget that they're able to spend on the type of services they're in and creates their own budget out of that and then tracks their own expenditures. This is all done either independently or with the assistance of a coach. And I've worked in full-fledged behavioral health social uh, self-directed care programs over the years, and we have found over and over that people at all levels of recovery can participate in self-directed care to some degree. The other thing that we look for is the ability to complete personal outcome measure interviews, which is really just an interview about how you see your own life functioning and what are the outcomes that you're looking for and whether or not you're achieving them. In self-directed care, the individual controls their own budget, they control their own life, they make their own decisions. Kirsten, would you like to pick it up from that? Yes, I can hear you now, Patrick. All members of the program staff will be trained in the importance of ensuring privacy and confidentiality, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, also known as HIPAA. Data collection instruments will be used only for the purposes of collecting qualitative and quantitative information specific to the services provided by the program staff. Data gathered for program evaluations will be stored separately from other SSDC data in a secure location. This information will only be accessible to a limited number of personnel, and that was basically Siobhan and myself. The identification of the participants will be kept private through the use of a coding system on records, as well as through the limitations of access to those records. And uh, for our life coach training, we all started off as peer support specialists, and we, we had extensive training in that uh, with the ethics and boundaries, with mutuality, 
shared, shared decision making and effective listening. We also went into motivational interviewing. And um, then for the uh, professional life coach training, it's a guide to participants to discover their own answers, help to identify challenges, and work in partnership to turn the challenges into victories. Uh, we challenged the thought behavior patterns of the participants and we provided accountability. And under psychiatric rehabilitation, this was the one through Boston University, it emphasizes that recovery is possible and highly probable. It's person-centered, strength-based, and they talk a lot about the recovery model versus the medical model. Now, we're going to have additional trainings for people who are interested in, in implementing this program. Mental Health America's experienced life coaches are available for free individual or group trainings by phone or video call. In-person training is also available for a reasonable fee. Personal training identification key parts of the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation from Boston University online, and that was the 60-hour course that we took. Uh, life coaching, becoming a professional life coach, lessons from the Institute of Life Coach Training by Patrick William and Diana Mendez. And then uh, for the motivational interviewing, there's a link there to go to that. Now, peer support is a huge part of this whole thing. And as peers, life coaches, we build trust. And we build trust because we understand we've been down that road before and people can sense that. And so there's an equality in the relationship. Information and experiences are freely exchanged. And both parties, both the coach and the participant, both benefit from each other's strength and hope. And now I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Thank you. So the next step in the process after the coaches have received their training is we began the outreach effort to find participants for the program. And we did that through direct marketing efforts at behavioral health centers, drop-in centers, recovery centers, any place where we could find people gathering. We gave presentations through local providers. We posted flyers and brochures in targeted areas around the community. And we reached out to potential contacts through email, phone, and social media. In order to qualify for the program, the person has to be at least 18 years of age, so it was an adult program. Um, they have to be able to give informed consent, so they have to be um, competent because they're making their own decisions and setting their own goals and creating really their own social treatment plan. And they must also agree to complete uh, guided journal exercises that we'll go into a little bit later that, that really kind of chronicle their experiences in the program. And they also have to keep receipts for the spending of stipends, need for services, um, as determined by personal outcome measures. So everybody, before they enter the program, are interviewed using a program called personal outcome measures. We'll get a little more detail into that later too. But it determines what a person's goals are in life and whether or not there's things lacking in their life that they would like to work on. Participation is completely voluntary. Nobody, nobody was assigned to this program. People joined up and um, everybody came in with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and, and that was before they even knew that they were going to receive a, a budget of funds that they could spend on social activities. So we certainly maintain confidentiality throughout. And then each participant at the very beginning, after they do their first interview, they're allowed to uh, look at the coach's bios and choose the coach they want. But the first thing they do is they receive a binder that shows all the enrollment agree agreements, uh, the different handouts and worksheets, how the 
guided journal works, and all of the forms that are involved. So they know what they're getting into before they agree to do it. Um, and then once they are in the program, as I said, they receive a, a stipend or a budget that they can use each month for their program that can only be used to purchase social activities or to go to events, something in the community. Um, there's a discussion in the book about professional boundaries, and there's also a discussion that takes place about how the coaches will kind of phase out of the process as people move forward in their own lives. All the coaches meet with the new participants, so all the coaches meet them. And then the person, each coach shares their bio, and the participants get to select the coach they feel best able to work with. This helps build trust and solidarity through self-disclosure, empathy, honesty, and authenticity. You know, the, the quality of being someone's peer is really what the individual who's receiving the services decides. You're only my peer if I feel you're my peer. So there has to be choice involved. And then the next step is goal setting. And the coaches sit down with people and kind of go through a process that we use called impact but we did it in, in great depth because this is probably the, the key part of the whole program is for people to really look deep inside themselves and try and figure out what their real goals are in life because if they don't choose goals that have great meaning to them, they're unlikely to make change in their life. They also look at whatever hobbies and interests and community involvement they have and this way they can plan on attending events where they can meet people with similar interests. After they've done all that, they sit down and they do their action plan and they use part of the impact tool to look at their plan and decide what their confidence level is in terms of whether or not they'll be able to achieve that plan. And if not, then they adjust the plan until they're very confident that it will work. And the final step is that they received, in our case, everyone in the program was on SSI. So everyone received $60 a month because that doesn't affect their SSI benefit. And, you know, if you're living on $730 a month of SSI, $60 just for social activities is pretty good to have. So each person took that $60 and created a budget. Siobhan, you want to take it from here? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so a major part of this is the relationship between the participant and their coach. Um, and so as part of this, the participants were given the opportunity to select their own life coach, given that they were of the same gender. Uh, participants were introduced to all of the available coaches. Uh, so Kirsten and I, being the main coaches, were available to the participants to choose. They received our bios, got to meet us in person, um, kind of interviewed us to choose whether or not we were their peer. Because as Patrick said, you're only my peer if I say you're my peer. So we gave them the opportunity to judge the compatibility of who they could relate to most. And we kept the dynamic of male-female uh, into consideration to avoid transference and counter-transference. And if I can say, add something to that, Siobhan, it was, that may sound strange, but in the beginning of this program, the coach really is the person's friend, and they go out with them often in the evening, and in some ways they're practicing building relationships, and they may even be practicing how they would go on a date or how they would ask somebody to go on a date. So we didn't want to introduce an element to the program that we weren't able to measure. So we made sure that we had women participants with women coaches and we had male uh, participants with male coaches. I don't know if that's necessary going forward always in this program, but we were trying to evaluate this program as closely as possible. Sorry, Sean, go ahead. So all of our participants received their stipend, uh, the monthly allowance of $60, as Patrick said, to be spent on uh, social activities. And those activities were related directly to their three social goals that they would set with the assistance of their life coach. And they could be changed from month to month. 
but everything that was purchased had to be related to those three social goals. So the amount was pending completion of the weekly guided journaling um, that participants were asked to do each week or at least by minimum every other week and consistently providing proof of purchase, uh, mainly through receipts, on how they spent the money. So uh, they were asked to keep record of that, and all the expenditures, as I said, must correlate to the social goals, to the action plan, and to the spending plan um, that must be approved by the life coach and the program director. Documentation for those purchases was recorded on a budget tracking sheet. That tracking sheet was provided to the participant um, by, from the coach in their handbook. That handbook basically composed everything that they needed for the program, so including things to help them identify their goals and set their budget. So if recipients were not provided, um, if receipts were not provided, or funds were spent on unauthorized expenses, the allowance for the following month would be reduced by that amount. And any money not used to accomplish social activities that's left over would be rolled over to the following month up to 50% of their monthly budget. And this allowed participants to the option to save for larger purchases that were related to achieving their social goals. For instance, we had someone um, who wanted to join a sewing club, and so each month she would put aside half of her budget to save for a sewing machine so that she could learn to sew and join a sewing club, which she is currently active in today. Okay, this is Kirsten again. and. Um under uh, forming partnerships, the visits with the life coach took place on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, and that was really based on need. Some people needed to be seen weekly, but others could go longer and be seen bi-weekly. In the initial meeting, they were very easygoing, and both Siobhan and I would go to their house, so not only would they have the bios from the binder, but they could actually meet and talk to us help decide which is the right coach for them. And uh, the initial meetings were working on goal setting and the budget planning. When not on outings, the visits were spent reviewing the journaling, goals, set skills and handouts and worksheets that will assist the participant in progressing towards their identified social goals. And these worksheets and handouts are going to be available on our website. Life coaches will be a safe sounding board for participants to express themselves and to work through their challenges. And a big part of this was we, we had to form boundaries. Boundaries are a very important part of the partnership. They are not intended to be a barrier but rather a framework for a healthy and productive relationship. Additionally, dual roles may lead to conflicts of interest that can jeopardize the whole peer connection. Life coaches must not engage in these kinds of relationships. They are not therapists, they're not sponsors, they're not payees, and they're not medication or treatment adherence monitors. We didn't do anything like that at all. The importance of co-creation or negotiation of conditions should also be noted. It required a conversation that is ongoing throughout the relationship. Subjects of discussion should include mutuality, respecting one another's time, personal space, how one would like to be addressed, topics that would be considered off-limits, cultural, religious, or other considerations on how to be with one another. Everyone needs to state their limits and to restate and redefine them as it becomes necessary. And I'm going to turn it over to Patrick again. Before I go into this, uh, I know we're going to do questions later, but somebody had a really interesting comment they posted. What, what do we do if the individual in the program is gay? And in that case, what we do is we have an, a discussion 
with the individual about how they would prefer to, to work with the program. Because we were working only with women coaches and women individuals in the pilot program, we would have a discussion and a person could choose if they wanted to go forward or not. And, uh, you know, it's always about choice, and that was probably the best we could do in that case because it was a relatively small pilot. So the next step in all of this is forming the partnerships, and the participants gain the ability to uh, grow and to uh, increase the intensity of contact with their coaches um, in the beginning, but then it's gradually withdrawn. Some of the examples of the tools that we use are uh, stress tolerance or distress tolerance. Mindfulness was a big one for people for stress reduction. Positive self-talk, affirmations, meditation, self-esteem, personal boundaries, etiquette, and social norms. Um, people participated in all kinds of activities. The coaches would often participate with people through role plays and doing worksheets, handouts, and playing games that had a social purpose. Occasionally, we did have group gatherings with all the people in the program, but that really wasn't the intent of the program. So. Going through all of this, participants slowly begin to build strengths in the areas that they feel they need strengths in. And we had some remarkable comments by people as they went through, like people who had never found themselves starting a conversation with a stranger. After a few role plays and a few exercises, they might go to Starbucks and start a conversation with the person at the table next to them and then journal about it and be so happy that they had done it. They had learned a new skill. So Kirsten, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, Patrick. Um, I, I think it's supposed to be going to Siobhan next. Siobhan? Yep, I'm here. I think I think it's going to you next. Let's look at the skill building. It was one of the life coach functions. Yes, uh, that's the right. Provided, the life coaches provided assistance and new social life skills in several different areas. And those areas included identifying areas of the participants' interests helping them to discover what their goals are, helping them to discover what they like to do versus what sometimes they're told to do, um, collaborating in decision-making with the participants as the shared decision-making as a part of the life coach's training, budgeting a spending account and attending social activities. The coach was responsible for attending those activities with the, with the peers and the participants um, if, if they so desired. Assisting in building community inclusion, helping them to become more a part of the community, and help, help form and enhance healthy relationships and intimate relationships. Um, for instance, there was a young lady who decided that she wanted to try dating again, and she used part of her stipend for an online dating site and decided she was going to go out on a date. So her coach helped her to, to gear up for that. Um, the coach also provides feedback and coaching regarding progress and building connections to employment and volunteerism if desired. We had some participants get uh, competitive employment. Some decided to do volunteer work, and we had two ladies go back to school. And Patrick is going to tell us the next step. So the next part of the process is the guidelines. And like we said earlier, everything that a person does that they spend money on has to be really linked to their identified goals. And they have to be consistent with their plan. You can change your plan in the middle of a month. It's just so it's documented because we need to be able to trace back expenditures compared to budgets, compared to plans, compared to goals. And that's the way a self-directed program runs. Um, so then they have to adhere to that plan. The coaches accompany people on activities or events and help them identify events. Sometimes they provide transportation 
to and from events if needed or help people find transportation methods. The coaches serve as a role model of recovery and positive social interaction. So a lot of time is just spent in conversation and you know, help, helping people to feel comfortable talking with somebody that they didn't know previously. Coaches may take participants to stores to get needed materials for upcoming social events or activities. That was fine with the program. The coaches apply their skills to become, I mean, the participants apply their new skills to become more independent in their social life and reduce their need for the coach. And as they do that, the coach gradually draws back a little bit, as much as the person would desire, so that the person can step out on their own and take more and more responsibility for themselves. And some examples of some of the things that people did was they went to museums, they went to the circus, botanical gardens, meetup groups, support groups, senior centers, centers, theaters, movies, bowling classes, baking classes, art classes, swimming classes, anything people could think of we encouraged them to do because the whole idea is to put yourself in situations where you're going to meet people with similar interests. And now it's Okay. Kirsten. Yes, um, on, on this page here, we're, we're seeing a form that we made for the It's My Life Social Spending Plan. And uh, as you can see, the allotment each month was $60. And the three goals came from other worksheets that, that are also, all these worksheets are going to be available on the web. But they, they came up with their three goals, and so they put them in one, two, three, and then uh, they, they listed the activity that they wanted to do, how it was connected to their goal, how much it was going to cost, and then the, uh, the total amount. And, and it was uh, related to one goal, or, or actually some people's goals, uh, it related to all three of them. Some of the activities would relate to all three of them. Examples of, uh, of this would be uh, uh, getting out of the house more, and, and so we took people to the movies. We took them sh uh, to, to the mall, just to walk around the mall. That's another example. And, uh, and each month, these could change. People could change their goals each month as, as they move further and further into the program. And, and these had to be approved not only by the life coach, but also by Patrick. He, he would approve all the, all the spending plans. And then later on, after they had spent the money, we had another form where they kept their receipts. Now, the outings turned out to be very interesting. Uh, initially, it was the participant and coach. And the coach would accompany the participant to the event or activity and initially provide transportation if needed. And a lot of times people were af afraid to go out on their own, so the life coach was very important in, in helping to ease that transition. Then the participant, coach, and friend. The coach serves as a role model of recovery and positive social interactions. The coach may take participants to stores to obtain needed materials for upcoming social events or activities. And uh, there were a few times when the, uh, the participant and the coach also brought along a friend, which is exactly what we wanted, because then it goes to participant and friend. The participant applies acquired skills to become more independent in social interactions, thereby reducing their need for the coach, and the coach gradually begins to pull away. And, uh, Here's some examples of, of outings. Uh, Patrick mentioned some of them, but we, we went on lots of outings. So we went to uh, monuments and museums in D.C., uh, went to the, the circus. I had one lady uh, took quite a few cooking and baking classes. We went bowling. We went to putt-putt golf, uh, art classes, drawing classes, ballet classes, going to uh, the Kennedy Center for, for theater. And uh, swimming classes, so uh, and also uh, meetup groups were very important. Okay, Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to accentuate that thing about meetup groups because one of the things we tried to help people do was to identify activities in the community that were free too, that, that didn't cost anything because that would broaden even more their ability to connect to the community. So the next step in this whole thing was what we used to evaluate it. And this was a very non-clinical program. We only had two clinical things that we looked at. One was we, as an afterthought, we thought about looking at hospitalization rates. So we did ask people for their hospitalization record for two years prior. We didn't ask any details, just how many times they'd been hospitalized. We didn't ask what for or anything. Um, and then we kept track throughout the program how many times they were re-hospitalized. And we had some amazing results we'll talk about. We also did a satisfaction survey because we just wanted to see how people felt about the program itself beyond how they felt about what they were achieving in their own personal outcomes. And in our satisfaction surveys, people rated it almost 90% excellent. Um, then we used the guided journals that we talked out about before. And the guided journals were where you journaled in a normal way, but there were also some specific questions we wanted people to answer each week or biweekly. And this is to give people and to give us insight into how they feel on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're using their skills and what skills they would like to learn, you know, what they learn through their experiences. Um, and then these are collected and copied and returned to the individual each week by the coaches. Um, then we used a, a personal outcome measures tool. This is a program that was developed by the Council for Quality and Leadership. And I've used it for about 15 years now. And it looks at 21 different quality of life indicators. How satisfied are you with your life? Because what good is a service that you receive if your life isn't getting better? I mean, that's the whole point of all services, I think. And out of the 21 life indicators that are in the personal outcomes program, and we'll look at the specific ones later, there were 13 that focused on social life and activities. And so we used those 13 as our indicators. And again, as we said earlier, we also used the personal outcome measures to determine eligibility because if a person said they have enough friends and they uh, – you know, feel connected to the community and they feel respected in the community, um, then really the program probably wasn't a good match for them. Um, Patrick, this is Stacy. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about where this stipend is coming from. If you could just address that quickly before we move on. Sure. We funded this program through a grant and then also through a fund directly from Mental Health America. And so we created the stipends out of our own budget. Um, we funded it for two years to pilot the program, develop and pilot it. And then we funded it for this year to just give it away to people. And we'll talk about some of that later, but we've created a full manual for this. It will be available on our website. Uh, so every step is manualized. Uh, we have all the handouts and forms and, and the outcomes available for you to look at on our website. So this is just a little bit more about personal outcome measures. Um, if I were you, this, this link is very long and you probably don't have time to write it down. All you have to do is Google personal outcome measures and you can go directly to their site. The, the only problem with personal outcome measures is if you want to become certified, it's fairly expensive to take the training, but you're allowed to purchase the handbook directly from the site for about $25, and reading a handbook will prepare you to use the tool very well, so I wouldn't worry too much about certification unless that's important to whoever your employer is. Then out of that, you know, the personal outcomes starts with a person's view of their own life. Like, where are they in that moment? Are they, do they have enough friends? Do they like where they live? Do they like the work they do if they do, if they are employed or volunteer? Do they feel like they're respected in the community? Um, how do they feel about the services they receive? Um, 
You know, do they participate in the life of the community to the amount that they would like to? Um, it's a whole bunch of just things that anybody could answer, and almost all of us would want something different than what we have. I mean, how many of us can say, I have all the friends I need, or I'm, you know, totally happy with where I live? Some of us will say that, but you can live in a mansion and still not be happy with where you live. So it's very personal. Uh, that's why we take a baseline with the people at the beginning and then interview them three times throughout the program. And the outcome defines what's important to the person. So we would look at, you know, do you, do you have as many friends as you like? We might arrive at that through a 10-minute conversation about friendship and how many friends they have and what they do. And so what we eventually come up with, they either do or they don't have as many friends as they would like. And so we can assign that a one or a zero. So you take a qualitative measure, but you get a quantitative outcome that you can show the funders because they always want to see numbers. So it's, a, it's really a good program to use when you're using especially government and grant funding. The interviews are done in a one-to-one -one conversation. And there's a series of questions in the book, but the best way to arrive at the answers is to really get to know the person and have a conversation and just kind of guide the conversation so that you make sure you cover every aspect of the outcomes. Um, and the book gives you some examples of ways to do that. Personal outcomes are, ways, are a way to gauge and analyze information that's non-tangible. I mean, like you said, the number of friends you want. And it comes up with a qualitative and then quantitative analysis of that. It's been used for over 20 years in uh, behavioral health, well, in developmental disabilities, it started about 20 years ago. And then I worked on the first pilot of it about 15 years ago in Florida where we normed it for mental health services. And I just, I still just believe it's the best tool I've ever used. Okay, this is Kirsten again. Uh, for the evaluation techniques, we had the guided journal. And the purpose was to provide insight about how the participants feel on a day-to-day -day basis, including social experiences and skills utilized. The participants are to journal weekly, although uh, we had to press some of them, and sometimes they just did it biweekly, but we, we pressed them to do it weekly. It was very important that they get this done if they wanted to continue to get the stipend. Writing in the journals was mandatory. Completing, uh, completed journals were collected and we copied them and then returned them to the participants, but we kept a, a, a record of all, all the journals and, and they were collected weekly or biweekly and then, and then returned. And then we also created a satisfaction survey. And it was a way for the participants to have an ad avenue to anonymously provide feedback about the program and the coaches. And uh, they were mailed to all the participants with a uh, business reply envelope included, so it was completely anonymous. And they were completed at the midpoint and then at the end of the program. And I'm going to turn it over to Siobhan now. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, addition, in addition to those uh, techniques for evaluation, we also looked at hospitalization rates. Um, you'll see there of the form that we used to track hospitalization amongst our participants. Um, so we first started out by taking a record of the number of hospitalizations two years prior to enrollment in the program. That was documented. And then we also documented any rehospitalizations that occurred during their participation. Uh, note was also taken of any changes that of services that they received. Uh, for instance, if they had um, joined a new program of some other sort or maybe got another therapist, um, or any changes in the services that they were currently receiving. So we made note of that as well. 
and the form there um, kept track of everything for us. And each participant was assigned an individual identification number um, for the data collection purposes and for record purposes in order to maintain their confidentiality. And the ID number um, put on the form and, and any other information that we collected from them did not include anything that was considered an ID marker. There was no names used, initials, date of birth, anything that could be used to actually identify the person we did not use because we wanted to maintain that, that crucial piece of confidentiality. So how did we look at success then? Well, we looked at it by the increase in quality of life as decided by the individual. And again, we're going to look at some charts in a little bit, but we had some remarkable um, changes in quality of life, the way people judged it to themselves. Overall satisfaction with the program. You know, did they like the way it was designed? Did they like the way their coaches interacted with them? Did they feel like they were respected by their coaches and the coaches listened to them? Um, and you know, we wanted to know what else they would like to change. And then we also looked at it by a really marked de decrease in hospitalization rates. And we'll go into that a little more specifically in a minute. So personal outcome measures, here are the 13 uh, indicators, actually just 12, I believe, that we use to, uh, to really grade how people were doing. People are connected to natural support networks. Uh, initially, only 25% of the people said they were, and the final scoring was 75%. Uh, people have intimate relationships, 25 to 63%. People exercise rights, 63 to 88%. People are treated fairly, 50 to 75%. People use their environments. This was one that really, you know, touched us all because only 13% of people we initially interviewed felt that they used their environment. And in the end, 88% people identified that they did. People interact with other members of the community, 25 to 63%. People perform different social roles, 25 to 63%. Now this one was really amazing to us. People choose personal goals, went down from 100% to 80%. And we couldn't figure out why, so we told everybody, we asked them, why did they score it the way they did? And it's because we taught people shared decision-making. And when they learn the principles of shared decision-making and person-centered planning and all of that, they realized how few of their own goals they were setting for themselves in normal treatment. Even though they might say it was their treatment plan and they might sign it and say it, who actually made the decision? So when people learned a little bit more about what they could do, then they realized that they weren't doing as well as they thought they were. People realized personal goals, 63 to 67%. So most people felt like they had at some point realized personal goals previously. Participate in the life of the community, 0% in the beginning to 75%. People have friends, 0% to 63%. And people are respected, 75% to 88%. So we thought these results were, were really uh, a very positive indicator of the success of the program. And Siobhan? Thanks. So uh, our results were also compiled from the guided journals. From them we learned that the program assisted participants in going outside of their comfort zone to be more connected to their outside world. Um, so we've got some really great quotes that we got from some of our participants in their journals, um, written on their satisfaction surveys, um, or things that they would send greeting cards to Patrick to let him know how they felt things were going. Um, there's, you can see there, the program helps me to be a little more confident. The friendships I have now are firmer since starting this program. Another young lady said, it has helped me to reach out and connect with other people. I love the program. It's like a dream come true. I'm learning new things about myself and others. 
Oh, this is one of my favorites. I am more confident to speak with people that I don't know. I'll introduce myself and talk with them. I used to wait for people to come to me. Now I start the conversation. So the guided journals also taught us that the program participants generally tended to feel good about getting out of the house and interacting with others, even when they weren't particularly excited about going in the first place. Um, again, there are some other quotes here. Um, I feel better when I stay busy. Just having something to do, getting out of the house, really changed people's mood and they felt a lot better. Uh, it brings tears to my eyes when I think about this program, one participant said. It was a revival for me. Going to Starbucks for the first time was a big treat. And the guided journals also taught us that when participants realized they were more than capable of learning new skills and responding appropriately to social stimuli, they had a boost in self-confidence and self-esteem that encouraged them to pursue further social interaction. So it was kind of a chain reaction. Once they realized that they were able to do this, to, to be out in the community and to actually connect with people, they were encouraged and it propelled them to do it even more and they, they just kind of grew more and more as the process went on. Um, another quote was that, I learned that if you follow your own path and don't constantly compare yourself to others, you will get further. Hi, and this is Kirsten again. Yes. And, uh, I talked about the satisfaction survey before, and, and these are the results. 17 participated in completing the survey, and it was done uh, via mail, and then they returned them in a self-addressed envelope. 95% of the respondents rated their satisfaction with the program with the highest rating. And I'm just going to go over the ones that were 100%. Uh, when I need help, I know who I can call to get support. My coach works in partnership with me to reach my social goals. I am satisfied with the help I have received from my coach. My coach is sensitive to my cultural and ethic background. And I think my coach supports my well-being. And uh, so those all were 100% uh, one that uh, uh, got uh, 16 of them said, overall, I feel that my social life is getting better because of the program. So by and large, everyone was very pleased with the program, and there was a section in there to, to write about anything else, and we got all kinds of great comments about how, how much this program had changed their lives. Now, uh, about the hospitalization rates, we talked about that before, that uh, we, we asked everybody for two years prior to entering the social self-directed care program, the participants had experienced a total of 15 hospitalizations. In the 19 months of the program, only one member had experienced a single hospitalization. And under hospitalizations, we also took into consideration things like going into crisis care, which is not exactly like a hospital, but uh, to go to a crisis center. So on, only one person had to do that in the 19 months of the program, which I, I think is a very good result. But that's what I think I'm proudest of, that uh, for all that time, only one person needed to go into the hospital. And, and some of them were going through a lot of things, but they, they managed to get through it with the help of their coaches. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things we looked at was whether or not people received any additional services during the time, and none of our participants received any additional services. So we couldn't find anything else that had changed in their life other than their social life. Um, so in conclusion, a summary of how it works, you know, the life coach goes through the training, we go through the recruitment process. Uh, you begin to form a partnership with the people you're working with, and you start through skill-building activities, and then 
finding outings to go on, and initially the coach goes with you if you want them to. Uh, sometimes the coach and a friend goes with you. But eventually we want people going out there on their own, and that's where people ended up. We used, you know, evaluation techniques. It wasn't a clinical program, so we, did, we tried not to ever use clinical language. So I think the only two things clinical about it was the hospitalization rates, and we did ask initially for people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Other than that, we took all the clinical language out of it. And then the results were extremely positive, and we continue, I continue to get emails from the participants, even though this pilot ended in December, of people just saying how wonderful it was and hoping that we'll be able to continue the program again in their area at a future date. I, t I too, have gotten a, a lot of uh, cards and letters and phone calls from people that they love the program so much and they're, they're anxious to see if it, if it starts up again, which is something that we would very much like to do. Now, in conclusion, the It's My Life Social Self-Directed Care Program is designed to help individuals with serious mental illness to build networks of friends and intimate relationships thus creating a strong social support system. Now, even though we only work with people with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder, we, we feel confident that this will work with any serious mental illness. This, in turn, helps the participant to become an active member of the community and feel less isolated, which also helps to increase self-esteem and self-worth, improving overall social functioning. The increase in overall physical health has shown to decrease the need for hospitalization as well as avoiding premature death. And if and I can I'm add to something, turn it over to you. if I can just add something to that, we didn't track uh, people's physical health, but in the end, we kind of asked people about that, and we found that people had better physical outcomes as they became more active. So. The program is very far-reaching in its effects. Siobhan? So overall, the It's My Life Social Self-Directed Care Program is highly relevant to any whole health approach to behavioral health. Um, savings in the reduction of emergency services, increased overall health, as Patrick said, and lowered rehospitalization rates makes this an affordable service for managed care and for state-funded programs. It would also be ideal for operation by a peer-run organization. And having focused on one of the most marginalized populations and receiving such remarkable results, it would be a reasonable expectation to, to expect that even you know, greater outcomes would be achieved for individuals whose mental health challenges may not be as complex as the schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Um, so we would expect even greater outcomes for those who have less challenges. And I'd like to add something here. This Today's presentation was just meant to kind of give you an overview. In the next two parts of the three-part series, and we're sending out the announcements about those, we're going to go into the specifics of actually what you do you know, what kind of activities you do, what goes through your training, what you need to know in order to provide this program, um, and be much, much more specific. And as I said, we encourage you to go on the Mental Health America website and download the manual. It's about a 100-page manual, and it goes into great detail. And it was very well written by Siobhan and Kirsten. So, and then, uh, Casey? Oh, you're okay. All right, everybody. Um, so now that we've finished with the bulk of the presentation itself, um, before we thank our sponsor, Janssen, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, um, we'd like to open up for Q&A. So we've been collecting some questions throughout the presentation, um, and I've been trying to group them. So if you have any last-minute questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat box on the bottom left hand of your screen right now, um, and we'll try and answer as many of those as we can in the next few minutes. Um, but this is a question for our presenters um, about Becoming a life coach. Um, some of the questions have involved: Do you have to be a peer? Do you have to be a peer support specialist to become a life coach? 
Um, and what are the other kind of professionalizing, like licensing criteria for being a life coach? There, when we set up the program, we decided that we wanted people who had experience providing peer support. And so we made the decision to use people who were already certified peer specialists. You know, a lot of peers have worked in peer support without ever becoming a certified peer specialist. And so if a person has significant experience and has done this type of work, there's really nothing intrinsic about the certification that would necess be necessary to this, other than the fact that in, in a good certification program, you do learn a lot of the skills that you need in this through the trainings that you take. And you also are very cognizant of the ethical boundaries and, and guidelines that uh, are necessary to providing any kind of services to uh, vulnerable people. And there's no other licensing of any type required. Again, it's non-clinical, so these are totally unlicensed positions. Wonderful. Um, and about the stipend, um, somebody asked if the stipend can be put, um, can be saved in a bank towards other goals, or is it something that needs to be spent kind of on, like on a more immediate basis? It can be saved, and uh, someplace in here, I believe we said you could save, or maybe I took it out you could save only $30 a month. There's no reason for that. People should be able to roll the money over from month to month. They may want to save up for something big so they don't spend any money for a month or two until they have enough money to do what they want. And we had one woman who more than anything, after many years of not having any money and not being able to do things, the thing she wanted to do was to go to the ballet at the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. And those tickets are quite expensive. So she saved her money, and she went, and she was just joyous. So, yes, you can bank your money. And she actually Great. did it um, twice. And uh, we had other examples. We had one lady who uh, wanted a, a digital camera, and she saved up for that. And then I, I had a lady who wanted to get a guitar. She wanted to take guitar lessons, and she saved up for that. All right. Um, and another question, did the stipend pay for coaches to participate in these activities as well? Would you repeat that? Uh, she, she said, uh, did the coaches receive a stipend as well? And, and we did. Uh, our, our stipend was also about $60 a month, although sometimes I think we went over so we could go with the people. To, uh, to the various activities. So we had a budget that we had to account for as well. Right. The coaches received a stipend, and they, were, they are employees of Mental Health America. So, I mean, this program, while it's not a terribly expensive program to do, it is a full-time job to do it well. And so you need to have peer specialists or peer coaches that are paid uh, for their time and you have to have the money for the stipends, both for the coaches and the participants. And, and there's also significant travel if you're in a big community. You know, our coaches were putting on hundreds of miles every week on their cars, and, of course, they were reimbursed for that. Okay, and that sort of leads me to the next question. How many participants um, work with each coach? For the purposes of our, our, our initial pilot, our first cadre, we tried to keep it at 10 people per coach. Um, we think that could be expanded to 15. Uh, we really wanted to go slow when we developed this program, and so we made it as conservative as possible because, again, we were choosing people who needed you know, maybe more attention than other people would be uh, if you were dealing with, with people who were a little bit more uh, advanced in their social skills. Okay. Um, and we've been getting this question a lot. People want to know how this program has not been implemented. We, we just piloted it here in Virginia on the Mental Health America over the past like, two-ish years. Um, so people want to know how do they get this in their areas because it's not currently in any other areas. Right. And, and like I say, we can provide all of the training. We can provide uh, consulting over the phone and by email. And if people want, uh, 
We're available to come to a location and do training. We can help you brainstorm about ways to find funding for it. You know, there are grants available for these types of community programs that you can go after. But the funding is the, is the key issue. You, you need an organization that can you know, provide the funding for it, and that generally means finding a new funding source. Uh, we're in the process right now of trying to convince local county government to fund the program on an ongoing basis in our area. So if people want to, if they need some, some help or some ideas or to bounce some, bounce some things around, they can contact you or Siobhan, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And if you can't so find the emails are on your screen right now, um, and you'll also be getting those as follow-up later. So you can always reach out if you need some help. And that very weird email, uh, website address at the bottom, that link, is what takes you directly to the social self-directed care documents. And there will be, um, as Patrick said earlier, there will be two more webinars in this series. One is going to be October 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, and one will be November 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Um, and we'll be sending out invitations for those, so keep an eye on your inbox. Um, I got a question here. Uh, did the members of the program meet together? And uh, it didn't happen a lot, but we, we held, uh, I think, three different events or, or little parties to uh, get the, the people together, and in one case, uh, uh, the people who met at the party, it turned out that they knew each other from something else, and, and they became friends and they started calling each other on a daily basis and, and became very close friends. So we were very happy about that. And one of the reasons why we didn't do that more often was because we wanted to make sure that we were also getting people the skills to make friends outside the mental health community you know, and not meet the same people that they would meet at services or at a drop-in or recovery center. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with having your friends come from that community. Most of my best friends do. But it's also really important that people learn how to relate to the, the community at large because there are so many more opportunities the more you expand your social circles. Um, we have another, a couple more questions about cost. Do we know anything about the cost saving of this program? What does this save in terms of um, health care costs and those sorts of things? We did not track that. We tried to set this up originally as a research project, and we were going to track costs, but we couldn't get funding for to do a real um, you know, academic evaluation and research project with a control group. And that would be the only way to determine cost savings was if we had a control group to compare it to. So unfortunately, we didn't do that. I mean, we can certainly know that by reducing hospitalization rates and reducing, uh, you know, improving overall physical health and uh, people adhering to their they're, and wanting to, participating in their own treatment, taking control, taking responsibility, self-activation in their own treatment. All of those things save money, but we weren't able to put a, you know, a return on investment kind of figure on it. Okay, um, another question was whether or not um, MHA state affiliates had MHA funding. Um, and I believe you answered this question already where we do not provide funding for people to go out and train, but we do the training here from MHA. Um, so if any affiliates are on the line and want help implementing this in their area or reaching out to agencies in their area who might be able to implement it for them, reach out to Patrick or Siobhan um, and we can get you that information that you need. Yeah, and we already have a couple of affiliates who are interested in doing this. The important thing to us is that the program be run by peers no matter who the agency is doing it, it needs to be you know, the coaches and the, and the uh, supervisor or director of the program needs to be peers because it is really a peer-oriented program in, and all of the work that's done on it is based upon the principles of peer support.
And do you think that this is a, Patrick, do you think that this is a program that would ever be Medicaid fundable? That's interesting because I'm talking with some of the managed care companies now about them implementing it using Medicaid dollars. Um, in the states that are still fee-for-service, probably not uh, because it's much harder to, to bill for peer services and generally the rates are really low. But in the states that have implemented managed care, particularly a couple of the bigger managed care companies, they're doing a lot of peer-run services and this one particularly appeals to them. So I, I met with the heads of uh, consumer services for two of the largest managed care organizations in the last month, and we discussed them implementing some pilots in their own areas. So those, that would be Medicaid dollars. I got a question here. It says culture and faith were a big part of the lives of some of the participants. It was part of... It was part of the program only if they wanted it to be. And um, there were uh, some occasions where uh, people went, uh, wanted to go to church, and had, had not been going to church for a while, but wanted to go back to church, and, and we went with them. That note there, uh, Kirsten was actually left by me. I was answering a question for someone else that had, had asked me that, um, whether or not we we saw culture and, and religion as a barrier, if that was a barrier for us, if it was something that the coaches were allowed to talk about with the participants. And really, we just left it as, as a self-directed model is. It was whatever the participants wanted. If they wanted to go to church, then the coaches would support them in that. It was It was about them making their own decisions and creating their own social network as they saw fit. And our participants came from a wide range of cultural and ethnic backgrounds. So, you know, the coaches really were totally non-judgmental and would participate with the person in whatever activity they wanted. I've got a question here. It says, how do you define peer? And uh, we, we define peer as, as somebody who had lived experience going through the mental health system, whether it was public or private, but, uh, but that, the, that they are um, that they're doing pretty well now. They've gone through trainings, or to be a peer support specialist, you go through several weeks of trainings. And... Uh, uh, and so we, we kind of prefer the, the term peer as opposed to consumer, which I know is what people used to call us, but now we're peers. The other thing we use to define peer is the individual defines peer for themselves. Um, a very good example of that is I, I've done a lot of work with the VA, and if you're in the VA and you have a peer specialist to work with you, that career specialists better have been in the military themselves. And if you are a combat veteran, that peer better have been in combat. Or if you're a woman veteran, that peer probably should be a woman vet. They're very particular about it in the VA, but I think we all are particular about that. Just because I have a diagnosis and I've gone through, you know, years and years of services, you may not find me to be your peer. We may not be able to relate to each other at all. And that's why we have the interview process and the people trying to build a relationship so they can choose somebody they feel an affinity for. I got another question here about uh, were there participants who didn't speak English? And uh, all of our participants did speak English, but for many of them, English was not their first language. I had the experience with, uh, with one participant who wanted to go to English as a second language classes, which were available in her area, and I went with her a few times, and then she started going on her own. And I had built into the budget the availability of interpreters if we needed it. We just didn't need them in our program. But it's, it would be very useful. You know, when you're setting up a peer-run organization that provides peer support, you want your peers to reflect the demographics of the community they serve. So if you have a community that, you know, has a, a large number of Hispanic or a large number of uh, Haitian population or any other cultural group, um, you know, 
it's impossible to have full representation on your staff, but the more you can, the better. And then, of course, it's uh, you know having the availability of interpreters is important. Any other questions? I think we hit on a lot of them. Um, we have a question here. Um, did coaching include reconnection with the family? So I think people are interested in what the coaching actually entailed and how that how that works with the community. If Kirsten or Siobhan would like to speak on that. Sure, I'll do that. Well, one thing that we, we did is we helped them to focus on, um, again, whatever they wanted to do. And for some of them, restoration of relationships with their family was important. Um, communicating with the people that they lived with, communicating with their children, spouses, things of that nature. Um, and so we, we would find ways for them to connect um, with their family members or with the people around them that they felt they wanted to connect to. Um, we also help them to find resources for uh, things like family outings. Um, there was one young lady who uh, used part of her, her money to uh, join Ancestry.com because she wanted to find some relatives. She didn't have many people that she knew or was related to. Um, and so she, she was able to do a family gathering um, in a public setting, which she normally would not do. Great, thank you. Um, and for everybody that's wondering if you have to be a peer support specialist, um, for the purpose of this pilot program, um, our life coaches were peer, are peer support specialists, but it depends how you implement it in your community. Um, so this, and in terms of how do you access the training, this is the first in a series of three training webinars. So this is part of the training right now. Um, so the next two webinars, like I said before, will be in October and November, and you'll be receiving an email with registration links for those. Um, the training materials and other guidance for that is on our website. The link is on your screen right now. Um, and for the people that have been asking about um, certificates of participation, you can contact Siobhan Carpenter. Her email is right there. Um, if you send her an email and let her know, she'll send you a certificate of participation um, after the webinar. So you do need to reach out so you can grab one of those. And I'd like to mention that uh, webinar number two is going to deal specifically with coach training. So we're going to look at things like intentional peer support, mutuality, effective listening, model recovery, life coaching skills, motivational interviewing, um, psychiatric rehabilitation, uh, self-directed care, things like that. So we'll get into some real specifics. Okay, um, and also the PowerPoint presentation is already on our website at mentalhealthamerica.net. Um, if you search It's My Life, Social Self-Directed Care, you can find the um, PowerPoint already under there. The recording of this PowerPoint, um, the recording of the webinar, will be on our website. It's mentalhealthamerica.net slash NHA-webinars. Um, and we'll put that link, um, once, we'll send that link out to everybody once the webinar recording has been uploaded. So you will be able to access this recording and share it with people in your area. Um, so that will be available to you as well. Um, now, how much more how much more training is available and needed after these three webinars? Well, I think if you use the manual and then you consult with us <clears throat> um, about any questions you have, it's really fairly straightforward. Um, it, it's something that I think in the long term we decided <clears throat> we had probably overly complicated it in the beginning. And so, like I said, I don't think it's necessary for people to go through the full life coach training and the full psych rehab training. There's aspects of it that are available in the manual that will be in our training. <clears throat> I want to make sure that we take time to answer the survey questions at the end, too. Um, okay, so I guess we'll wrap up. The survey questions will be, um, you can access those once the webinar ends. 
when, when you close out of the webinar, you'll see the survey. Um, so please, please uh, fill that out. Let us know how we did today. Um, let us know if you're interested in starting this program. Um, any comments that you want to leave, you can put that in the survey. Um, if you go back one slide. Um, we just wanted to, to thank Janssen for sponsoring our pilot program and for sponsoring these trainings. Um, we, they've helped us do a lot of good for a lot of people, and we hope that we can expand that. So thank you, Janssen. Um, yeah, so please feel free to reach out to Mental Health America if you have any questions or need any help. Um, I want to thank Patrick, Kirsten, and Siobhan for a great job and a great presentation today. Um, and I want to thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, Next slide. And then this last slide, if you need a certificate, uh, certificate of attendance or participation, reach out to Siobhan. Um, and keep an eye out for the other training webinars. We'll be sending out those registration links shortly. And thank you very much. Please fill out the survey when you get a chance. And have a great afternoon. Somebody asked about the handouts. And <coughs> they're available on the website too, the handouts for the webinar. And somebody else asked if they could email answers. If you would email us with your question again, we would be more than happy to answer them. Great call. Thank you for catching that. Um, so yeah, so email us with any questions if you didn't get your question answered. Um, we had well over 60 questions, so thank you, everybody. Um, and have a great afternoon. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help spread the awesomeness that is social self-directed care. Thanks, Casey. All right. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.